the Eruv not only um, provides you know, a means for somebody to, some stray individual to carry his key or just carry books, it really is a, a vital facilitator of social communal connection. If I want to carry my talus to shul, if I'm visiting, uh, if there's a bar mitzvah in, uh, in the shul and you've got to bring, you know, uh, some of the food or you want to, you know, whatever, or there's an older, uh, you know, uh, person who's wheelchair bound that you want to wheel to shul, you know, the air obviously solves that, uh, solves that problem. Um, with little kids in carriages, the air was a very important reality. Today, to see someone carrying a, a Gemara going to Dafyom Yishir Shabbos is hardly noticeable. This is not a recent invention. Uh, there's a tractate in the Talmud uh, that deals with Eruv. Eruv is such a necessity for a normal life on Shabbos. This is a vital piece of religious infrastructure for the Manhattan Jewish community, no question about it. It's not just supposed to make Shabbos less, it's supposed to make Shabbos more. It makes life li livable on, on Shabbos. I don't know when I first knew about Eruv, but it certainly wasn't in my early years, because you knew from growing up that on Shabbos you wouldn't carry. When I was growing up, I made sure that my comb and my lipstick were, all, were safely ensconced in shul, so I didn't have a problem with carrying, carrying anything on Shabbat. Well, I had two little kids, and also I wanted to be able to carry my sermon notes and other things to the synagogue on Shabbat, and I found myself in, in an untenable situation. My father lived in Hillcrest, the next community with my brother, and he needed to carry silver nitrate pills. So the answer was stay home. Um, he certainly was not going to carry them otherwise. So what he developed was he bought a hat, a size too large, wrapped it in a tissue, put it in his hat band so he would have it with him. The only way it could be permissible to carry would be is if there were walls and where all openings were then enclosed by, as it were, doorways plus doors that were capable of being closed. The only way you would, you would think about it is in terms of your backyard. And, and what would you do to make sure that your backyard was within an area so you could read or eat or do things there on Shabbos? I spent, I, I do recall that the, since much of the time I didn't have help on Shabbat, is um, mostly staying home on Shabbat, getting into bed, reading my kids' stories. You know, whenever the, wherever the area was pushed forward, I think what was pushing it was sensitivity to women and young children. Uh, this essentially emancipated the women. Really interesting group of women that met during the week found themselves entirely isolated on a, on a social level from other young families. So they decided, you know, what we're going to do is we'll get together on a Monday night or a Tuesday night on a Wednesday night so at least we have some sort of communal social interaction which would normally be in the context of a synagogue on a Shabbat morning but which they didn't have access to because there was no Eruv. I didn't, I didn't miss the Eruv. But I do remember, actually, I shouldn't say that, because I always went on the Chagim when I could push a stroller. Now, in Europe, they had it in the little shtetl, so you could carry your chalm from the main town oven, you know, to your home on Shabbos. But, uh, you know, in the United States, this was a sort of a foreign concept. In Amsterdam, there was an air roof, and, uh, and it never happened that, 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 that the air roof was, was broken, not kosher, announcement made, none of the above. The rumbling started, why don't we have an Arab? You know, we're all prisoners. It was the, what we today would call the Khanidim. They were the ones who pushed it. They pushed it because they come from Europe. In Europe, every Rav was told he has to build a mikvah, he has to build a, uh, a school with marriage, and he has to have an Arab. You know, the first Shabbos that it was up, Steve Orlow, Dodo, and I, uh, with our wives, walked all over. The, we walked literally, like Avram Avina walked, okay, Eretz Israel. We walked the whole community from park to park, from street to street, and we were beaming. It was unbelievable. Really because amazing. It was amazing. People were out for the first time. People were looking at us like they were freed. We needed permission from the city for every step of this. You get a proclamation, which is, in most cases, the first step in in creating an area. Somebody was working for um, uh, for Mayor Koch in his re-election campaign. 
we said we need the mayor to support authorization for the construction project. He said, well, you know, let's, why don't you invite him to speak at Lincoln Square during the campaign? And I will suggest to him that uh, it would be nice if he could announce at that occasion that he has just signed the document authorizing the installation of an Eruv. What was involved here wasn't just the city of New York. You had the telephone company, you had Con Edison, you had state highways department, city highway department, you had city department of parks. We discussed with various contractors whether or not it was feasible to actually put up the wires where we needed to have them put up. We went to major contractors, electrical contractors, to ask them to put up these lines. Obviously we didn't have guys who were going to shimmy up all these poles. We needed apple pickers, we needed this kind of heavy equipment. But again, these were strange concepts. Imagine sitting down at a table and trying to explain to these individuals the concept of an air roof. You know, explain to somebody that you want to put up a wire because you can't carry, and it's our Sabbath, and you can't do this. For us, maintaining the air roof um, is, is something that we, we take as a very, very serious and sacred responsibility. So we have one air roof checker who, every Thursday, um, with his driver, goes out and inspects the entire periphery, all, the entire boundary of our Arif. There's so much construction going on in Manhattan that the, we couldn't maintain the Manhattan Arif. Uh, as fast as you would repair it, it would get broken down. We have an Arif that is probably much high, what has a much higher maintenance requirement than any suburban Arif. Just because of the nature of this bustling city with cranes going through for construction projects and also you know you have many other types of, uh, of interventions mm -hmm. uh, now in terms of the the actual organization that supervises it it's the Mahon mm -hmm. it's a Hasidic kolel that's based in the Muncie area which has a an expertise in a variety of areas. It has also a group of individuals who spend a considerable amount of time training not only in the halachic areas of Erevin but also in the practical matters of designing urban Erevin. There are different types of observant Jews who accept the Erev or who don't accept the Erev. And there are some who continue to not carry within an Erev because it's not their understanding. Just because there is an Erev doesn't mean that any individual has to use it just means that it's available for those who do want to use it. There are some members of my family who don't hold by this Erev or that Erev, um, and, and, and one that doesn't hold by an Erev at all. And I remember I had cousins living in Paris, and my cousins told me, which at the time didn't go into my head, said, the old people in Paris carry. But the, the new people uh, uh, who came to Paris, they don't carry. Um, that to the degree that we take the Sabbath from being unique and a kind of noble sanctuary and make it more like every other day. I can carry all during the week and I can carry on the Sabbath. So you're losing something of the uniqueness. The need for an Eruv on Shabbat is probably not as widely recognized within the non-Orthodox community. The major objection came, it was interesting, not from Gentiles, but from, again, non-religious Jews who were sometimes terrified or petrified or upset that the uh, ambience of the community would change, that they would feel uncomfortable, for example, from the Sabbath, they would drive or they would walk around and in uh, clothing that might be inappropriate. If you, if you build an air you need a, an atomic bomb in your backyard. We're talking about the 1950s. Women were wheeling baby, baby carriages. They were not staying home. And they were violating Shabbos. They carried keys anyway. They carried handkerchiefs anyway. But everybody was doing it. I think that was common far beyond Manhattan. I was one of the younger group of rabbis together with Rabbi Lamb, mm -hmm. uh, who sort of helped the older group 
get the Manhattan Eruv going. Rav Kasher was the initiator of the whole idea. And we spoke to Rav Henkin, particularly. And the two of them agreed that we should go ahead and do this. Rav Henkin, in particular, was very anxious for the Arab to be completed because he said it would save thousands of people from Chilul Shabbat. And Rav Henkin played a role. And he was in favor of the Arab, basically. He understood what, what the problem was, you know. I remember we were happy that we yeah. could get a uh, good gag. People were grateful, and they were able to take their children down on a summer day, and they were able to carry keys. Personally, I wasn't comfortable with the Manhattan as an island, a roof. Manhattan is, in fact, Rosh Hashanah in the Oraita, that it is a kind of domain in which a roof is not sufficient. That led me, really, to the personal adoption of the position of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, as to the unacceptability of an era in Manhattan. There is a gut opposition among certain sectors of the community because of the opposition on, on certain halachic grounds um, to a Manhattan era by the late Rabbi Moshe Feinstein mm -hmm. of blessed memory. The argument, to the best of my knowledge, was if you make an era in Manhattan, and there is no Erev in Brooklyn, because in those days there wasn't any. Uh, then people are going to carry across the bridges into Brooklyn and they're going to be Mechal Shabbos. What it meant was, if there isn't an Erev everywhere, there can't be an Erev anywhere. Over the years, there were certain physical realities that changed in Manhattan um, that made the premises of that broader Manhattan era of um, more difficult um, to understand and, and certainly to maintain. We always had uh, m financial problems with the Manhattan era. It always had to be fixed and, and there were repairs that had to be made. So where a boundary once may have existed, it was no longer there. No one actually seemed to know uh, what the actual boundaries were. It seemed to me unlikely that anyone was actually checking them. Uh, and so in consultation with Rabbi J.J. Schachter uh, and Rabbi Buchwald, uh, uh, we were in touch with Rabbi Zinner. We invited Rabbi Zinner to join us in a boat trip around the island of Manhattan. Uh, by the time we completed that trip, uh, it seemed clear that whatever installations had been done or whatever construction existed um, in the late 1950s, uh, that that no longer existed in its entirety. Even if the Erev um, could be constructed to enclose a much wider area, it would be almost impossible to maintain as it once was to include the entire island of Manhattan. It was certainly not going to publicly announce that the, the that it was not permissible to rely on the positions of, of Rabbi Riskin and Rabbi Hankin and Rabbi Lamb and Rabbi uh, Kasher, uh, but I felt that it was my responsibility eventually to move toward some better resolution of this particular matter. Rabbi Saul Berman started to make an Erev on the west side. The, the Upper West Side was, by the late 1980s, uh, a very diverse community. There was growth of, of, uh, of, of much more um, uh, so, uh, Hasidic or, or yeshivish communities, congregations, within the Upper West Side. Those communities did not rely upon the Kasher Eruv. The, the only way that it could um, create something that would be satisfactory to me would be to function within the Shita of Reb Moshe and therefore would require Dalsos. The vast majority of the space of the Upper West Side was actually enclosed by walls or buildings. All of those walls were intersected by openings of transverses through the park or streets running north-south. And to deal with those, 
uh, again, the, the traditional response of halacha has been that just as in a walled city, which may have multiple gates, that even if the gates are open, um, so long as the gates are capable of being closed, um, that it is considered to be enclosed, it occurred to me that it should be possible to create some form of door that would be possible, through which it would be possible to close every one of those intersections. I was working with engineers to try to figure out a way to create dances that could possibly be acceptable in the city of New York. It took an enormous amount of time to get the development of canisters uh, which could, uh, without great fanfare, be attached to lampposts which would contain the doors that could in fact be stretched across the intersection and then rolled back up into the canisters. The Parks Department was very opposed to every step of this because it involved canisters and wires being installed in lampposts at the edges and sometimes within the parks. But the mayor's office came down on them very hard and insisted that they cooperate with us. The process of installation began in late 1992 and it took until 1994. The West Side then had an Arab. The word sort of went out that the Manhattan Arab was not valid. So people began to question the whole thing. I couldn't argue the halacha. If you really didn't think this was a good Arab, then don't carry. But don't make another Arab which implies that the first Eruv is no good. People have gotten used to using the Eruv. The financial support for the uh, Manhattan Eruv uh, became even more problematic. It was very difficult to maintain it. In 2003, we decided that we were going to start expanding the Eruv, the small Eruv, which was viewed as a Mahadrin an era of acceptable even by the more punctiliously observant parts of the community on the west side, a small area to try and expand it and continue to expand it um, to Jewish communities which found that Erev to be important to their Jewish life. And to his credit, Rabbi Kermeyer put his mind to it and his effort to it and he created a local Erev that covered a fairly wide area. The communities have decided that the model we wanted to use is that this is a communal responsibility. I'm not even sure that given what a high maintenance area of it is and how expensive it is to operate, that it would be a feasible project if we didn't have this type of, you know, of respect and, and, and a real sense of communal responsibility. It was never about, boy, now we can carry. It was now we're a neighborhood. We're a neighborhood that can function as a neighborhood. We don't live without an A-roof anymore. I don't even remember how difficult it was to live without it. The concept of A-roof is such a beautiful one because what it says is that we can use law to provoke a sense of extended family and a sense of community. We seem to have an era of wherever we go. Today there's no excitement. Today you go to a place no matter where you go. I was just in uh, Kansas City. Is there an era? Of course there's an era in Kansas City. I go to my family in Cleveland and there's an era. I was in Ottawa last week. Of course there's a, an era. If I go to my family in Atlanta and there's an era. Why are there so many lawns in the era? On Shabbos we carry outside. The Eruv made headlines and new families moved in, but now there is nothing to buy. So many homes sold, some Jews can't believe it, renters are hopeless.